Welcome back to my review of The Walking Dead Season 2 for the last time. I've talked at great length about the episodes individually, covering all the good and bad things about them, but there are some things that don't pertain to one specific episode or aspects of the game that apply to the season as a whole. And this video will hopefully do a sufficient job of covering all those topics. I understand that deeper discussion about this game is something that only Walking Dead fans will really care about, so if you just want my thoughts on this game without going into detail about every episode, this is probably the only video in the series you'll want to watch. I'll also be covering some behind the scenes aspects of the game, but I'll save that for the end of the video since it doesn't deal with the game itself, so you can avoid it easily if you don't care about that stuff. Let's start with the characters. Season 1 had a good cast of characters that played an important part in the story. Even the villains and unlikable characters were good and well written, and characters that were around for only one episode managed to serve a purpose in the story before they died. Two of the survivors of Season 1, Krista and Omid, are killed off right at the beginning of the game. So right away we're only left with Clementine to care about. We're introduced to the new cast of characters that we'll be dealing with for the season about halfway through Episode 1, and none of them leave a strong impression. In fact, about half of them are unlikable. They warm up to Clementine eventually, but it happens so quickly that it doesn't feel realistic or believable at all. And the cabin group really never gets any real backstory or character development that allows us to care about them. We learn next to nothing about Alvin and Carlos, Luke just seems like a generic nice guy with no depth to him, and screws up numerous times and we don't really learn anything about him until about 10 minutes before he dies, which is far too little too late. Nick surprisingly gets the most character development out of everyone in the cabin group, and he's probably one of the most squandered characters in the entire game. He was very obviously being set up for a redemption arc, but it ended up not happening because Telltale kept changing the story between episodes, which I'll be covering later. And speaking of squandered characters, Sarah felt like she was supposed to be really important. I really think she was supposed to be to Clementine what Kenny was to Lee in Season 1. You can choose rather not to be friends with her upon meeting her, and unlike other characters in this game, she actually treats Clementine differently depending on this choice and how you treat her. But like Nick, whatever her relationship with Clementine was building up to, got squandered because Telltale changed the story during development, and Sarah ends up dying the very episode she becomes the Terminant. Rebecca is just like the rest of the cabin group in that she doesn't really do much in the story, but she does get a little bit more interaction with Clem than the rest of the group besides Luke. Of course, when she gives birth to the baby, she's almost immediately killed off, so she's really just an incubator for a plot device and not much else. Pete belongs to a group of characters that are far too prevalent in this game, the likable characters that are killed off the episode they're introduced group. Out of everyone in the cabin group, I easily liked him the most, and given his relationship with Nick, we could have easily learned more about Nick through Pete. Episode 2 gives us the reintroduction of Kenny, and an introduction to the people he's staying with. Of course, Walter's in the same group as Pete along with Matthew, and Sarita really doesn't do anything of any importance. She's just more or less the reason Kenny found to keep living after losing his family in Season 1, and dies for his character development. There are some other characters to talk about, but I'm not going to waste too much time talking about them as there's really not much to say about them. Troy is just a generic henchman of Carver who gets screen time so he can hate him and be happy when he dies. Reggie just serves to demonstrate Carver's Darwinist mentality, although I think I would have liked him lasting a bit longer since I think a game like this needs a comic relief character to lighten the mood and give us a break from all the zombie apocalypse bullshit. Mike, a character who surprisingly lives past the episode he's introduced, is just another generic nice guy who wants to be accepted in Clementine's group, but then he decides to undo all of that by attempting to rob them, leaving them with nothing. As I mentioned in my episode 3 review, he was originally supposed to be one of the bandits that attacked Krista in episode 1, and Clementine would be given an option to forgive him after recognizing him. But the story was changed and this was scrapped, most likely because it would have caused the episode to last longer than 90 minutes. Bonnie is a character from 400 Days, a DLC for season 1 of The Walking Dead, and she's the only one from that DLC that has a role in the story. Every other protagonist is reduced to 5 second cameos. Bonnie is easily one of the most unlikable characters in this game. Like everyone else, she doesn't do much, but she lies to Clem, Walter, and Kenny about having a family to feed when in actuality she's working for Carver, defends Carver after what he does at the lodge, eventually realizes that Carver is a bad guy and helps Clem's group, only to end up betraying Clementine a second time by, like Mike, stealing everything they have. She also gets mad at Clementine, blames her for Luke's death, and says that because she's a kid, nobody expects her to do anything if you choose not to try to save Luke yourself. So yeah, fuck this bitch. Well that covers most of the main cast and the side characters, let's talk about the villains, or antagonists if you were. Carver is the first villain we get, and after all the foreshadowing leading up to him, 
he ends up being really underwhelming. I think it was possible he was supposed to be an ambiguous villain with implications about the cabin group that indicate that they're not as nice as they seem, and maybe Carver had a justified reason for wanting to take them back. But by episode 3, the cabin group doesn't have any dark secrets revealed about them, and Carver devolves into being an unlikable asshole with no redeemable qualities, and a generic Darwinist villain who s seriously thinks that Clementine is just like him, despite the fact that he met her only a few days ago and regardless of how you played. You can be a completely nice, polite, and honest Clementine, and Carver still gives you his stupid, you and me are more alike than you think speech. And before that, he threatens that you'll end up in a chair that a beat up Alvin is in if you lie to him. But if Alvin died in episode 2, then the chair is empty and it gives the threat a feeling of, what did he mean by this? The fact that he's voiced by Michael Madsen gives a good indicator of what kind of character Carver is going to be, but I honestly expected him to be more like Mr. Blonde from Reservoir Dogs than a generic Darwinist. Maybe he would have been a better villain than what we got if he was. Arvo... Despite the long rant I went about him in my last video, Arvo is, in actuality, barely a character. He comes into the story way too late to make an impact on anything, and he doesn't have much of a personality or get any character development. We really don't learn anything about him, and it's never explained why he hides the medicine that's supposedly for his sister in a garbage bin instead of taking it to the half-built house he was staying in. None of the reasons I can think of for why he would do this can really be confirmed one way or another because, again, we don't really learn anything about Arvo. I talked in the last video about how Arvo shooting Clementine isn't an accident, but really, there's no reason for him to shoot Clementine at all. Arvo hating Clementine for killing his sister doesn't make any sense, and I already explained why in my last video. His hatred for Clementine is extremely contrived. It doesn't matter if she doesn't steal from him and or stands up to Kenny for him, Arvo always shoots Clementine. He's probably the most poorly disguised plot device in the entire game. He just hates Clementine and shoots her because of this, and there's really not much else to say about him. He's just a villain for the sake of being a villain. Unclear motivations, forced drama, and inconsistent character behavior are all problems most of the new characters in Season 2 suffer from, and Arvo encompasses all of these things far too well. Jane being the surprise antagonist for the finale of the game is probably more contrived than Arvo shooting Clem. It doesn't even feel like she was meant to be a surprise antagonist because nothing foreshadows it. Jane is actually one of the worst written characters in the game. Her characterization is all over the place. She tells Clementine that emotional ties hold you back but then cries about her dead sister. She implies Rebecca should abandon her baby but then gets upset when Rebecca mentions her dead sister. She tells Clementine that she can't come with her when she leaves the group but then not only does she come back to be with Clem, she lies about the baby being dead so she can kill Kenny and have Clementine to herself. She apparently cares about Clementine but can demonstrate that she's unwilling to risk her own life to save her. She talks about how it doesn't feel right to kill a man who didn't do anything wrong to her when she helps the group in the gunfight, but then antagonizes and lies to Kenny a man who did nothing wrong to her, so she can kill him. She tells Clementine that she's better off on her own, but then tries to manipulate Clementine into going with her, contradicting her own advice. In her ending, when the choice to let the family in comes up, if you let the timer run out, Jane surprisingly lets the family in. You would think this is a moment of Jane being selfless for once, but in the ending where you turn the family away, she says that she wasn't sure if she could turn them away after looking at the kid, but is glad that you did turn them away. So what this actually means is that she didn't want to live with the guilt of a child potentially dying by denying them shelter, and would rather have Clementine be responsible for that if it were to happen instead. Wow. And this isn't even the first time she does something like this. If you let the timer run out on the choice to rob Arvo, Jane surprisingly lets him go, but blames Clementine for Rebecca not getting the meds that she needs. That's relief to Rebecca's suffering walking out that door because you couldn't make a choice. That's on you. What a fucking... Bitch. Why doesn't she just rob Arvo anyway? It's what she wants to do. Does she really need an 11 year old's approval that much? On top of all of this, in her ending she has the audacity to judge Clementine for watching Kenny kill Carver if she did. I don't... I don't know how you were able to watch that. Considering what you just did to get Clementine to go with you, you have no right to judge her for that. Really though, Jane has no consistent character. She acts however the plot needs her to act, and the only thing consistent about her is her Darwinist mentality. But even that gets thrown out the window when she goes from threatening Arvo to defending him from Kenny and complaining about Kenny slapping Arvo's shit, and how she's willing to die to keep up her lie about the baby being dead. 
Carver and Jane both have something in common in that they both try to influence Clementine with their survivalist mentality, but how they go about it is different. Carver sees Clementine as a strong leader type, whereas Jane encourages her to be a lone wolf like her, even though she wants Clementine to herself. The amount of alone time we spend with Jane in episodes 4 and 5 along with how the game wants you to pick her over Kenny in the final choice makes it very clear that the developers favored her and I have to wonder why this is. I said in my episode 4 review that I didn't hate Jane despite what she does in episode 5, but at that time I had only read about the Jane endings and not actually seen them for myself. I was forced to watch and work with footage of the Jane endings in order to do my episode 5 review, and after seeing the Jane endings for myself, I can safely say that I do hate Jane now. But really, even without what she does in the ending, she's not a good character. She's an inconsistent hypocrite, a Mary Sue, and very obviously a creator's pet. Before I get to Clementine, let's talk a bit about Kenny. I already covered most of what there is to say about Kenny in my reviews for episodes 2 and 4. As I said in my episode 2 review, his return is an ass pull because we're given no real explanation of how he survived the inescapable situation he got himself in at the end of season 1. But his return is ultimately a good thing as Kenny's pretty much the only good or interesting character in this game. Kenny's the only character that has any real character depth in season 2 going on an emotional roller coaster ride where he wants to die but also wants to live so he can take care of Clementine and later AJ. And I think part of the reason for his character death is because he's a character from season 1 and thus already has a defined personality, so it was easier for the writers to write him. Granted, he's simpler than he was in season 1, but that's for two reasons. One, everything is simpler in season 2. And two, there aren't as many varied interactions with Kenny as there were in season 1. There are only a few moments where he changes how he treats Clementine based on your choices, and even then it's not as bad as how he could be with Lee. And by episode 5, everybody's against him, so Clementine is pretty much the only character he's nice to at this point. <sighs> and yes, I will be talking about how Kenny is characterized as the bad guy in episode 5, when in truth he's the real hero of season 2 yet again later on. Kenny's pretty much the only character I ended up caring about in this game along with Clementine, if he wasn't in the game, who knows how much worse this season would have been. That said, I liked him more in Season 1. Aside from being simpler in Season 2, his character traits are exaggerated after he gets beaten by Carver, and while his actions are still justified, it makes his character less appealing. And I suppose somebody who hates Kenny would probably dislike Season 2 more than someone who likes him. But those feelings might get turned around on both sides once the option to shoot Kenny comes up. And now for the protagonist herself. If it wasn't apparent enough in my previous videos, I'm very unhappy with how Clementine turned out this season. I've often seen it stated that making Clementine the protagonist was a mistake, but I don't think Clementine being the protagonist was a mistake, it's how it was handled that made it bad. Specifically, giving her options to act out of character is the biggest problem with Clementine's character in Season 2, at least in my opinion. I understand that Clementine's character would change after years in the apocalypse, but the fact that they skipped 16 months and told us nothing makes it very hard to believe any of the out-of-character behavior she can potentially do in this game. Yes, I know that her out-of-character actions are determinant, she won't act out of character if I don't want her to, but the fact that these options are included in the game to begin with is basically Telltale saying that it's possible for her to act this way. They wouldn't be in the game otherwise. And even then, she says shit no matter what in episode 2. I honestly think Clementine being okay with squaring could have been something that could have been part of some interesting character development, but instead she maintains her attitude on it from season 1, and then in the very next episode, without any reason or explanation, it's completely gone and she's squaring herself. Honestly, it feels like part of the reason they had Jane do what she did in the ending is just so they could give Clementine a justified reason for having her drop her first F-bomb. And while we're on this subject, I want to call bullshit on something. Episode 5 gives Clementine more options to swear than any other episode, as I mentioned in my last video, but some of them are hidden behind options that don't give any indication that they'll make Clementine swear. So I could be trying to play her as in character as possible and end up breaking that because of a misleading dialogue choice. What a fuckload of shit. But to get back on topic, the fact that we don't see the change she goes through in the 16 month time skip means that we don't see how Clementine becomes a cold, passionless, and potentially manipulative and immoral person. I mean, what if in the original Star Wars trilogy, The Empire Strikes Back didn't exist, and Luke Skywalker immediately went from being a rebellious farm boy to becoming a mature Jedi Knight? Yeah, that's where his character was going eventually, but without seeing what he goes through in Empire Strikes Back, the change feels so sudden that he's basically a different character. 
It's the same problem here. Season 2 Clementine is so different from Season 1 Clementine, she's essentially a new character. Aesthetically, yes, she's the same little girl I fell in love with in Season 1, but in terms of personality, she is mostly in a lot of ways opposite of Season 1 Clem. In Season 1, Clementine was thoughtful, brave, kind, and selfless throughout the whole game. She stood up for the less fortunate and tried to think of solutions to bad situations. She displays a childlike charisma that can sway adults and is generally accepting of others. In Season 2, Clementine is completely dependent on adults, only doing what others tell her to, and can revel in someone's death, talk down to people, and just in general be selfish, bratty, and immoral. The biggest irony in all of this is that Season 1 Clementine is smarter, braver, nobler, and even even more independent than the supposedly more badass Clementine of Season 2. And 16 months isn't really that long of a period of time. I would find it more believable if Clementine changed like this by the time she got into her teens, but only going from 9 to 11? By the time Season 2 ends, literally nothing of the original Clementine exists. Two years, and not only is she completely different, but she can potentially be a direct contradiction of who she used to be? Let me put it like this. If you were to change Season 2 Clementine's appearance, name, and history, but left everything else the same, would you think to yourself, this character reminds me of Clementine? Really though, most of the edgy shit Clementine can do in Season 2 is really just for the sake of entertainment, and to appeal to a part of the fanbase that enjoys the novelty of watching a formerly sweet kid act like a piece of shit to the people she doesn't like. I'll admit I was part of that crowd too, until episode 5, and I'll still admit that some of the bad things Clementine can do is entertaining, but it's certainly not good writing. I mean really, for what reason does Clementine have for being an asshole to Sarah other than because people in the fanbase hated her? What reason does Clementine have for lying to Walter about Nick killing Matthew, or covering for Walter about allowing Nick to die other than people who didn't like him wanting him dead? Even the decision to blackmail Rebecca seems out of character for her now that I think about it, because we never see the transition Clementine makes to being capable of being that manipulative. The only way Clementine doing things like this makes sense is if they give us a good reason for her doing these things. Clementine reveling in Carver's death, for example, would have made more sense if it was actually her who got beaten by him for stealing the radio. Aside from destroying her plot armor and establishing that she's not untouchable, it would also make the decision to not watch his death a powerful moment for her. It would show that she won't stoop down to his level despite the fact that he almost beat her to death. Another problem is that the story hardly focuses on Clementine even though this is supposed to be her story. Until the adults need her for something, Clementine is just… there and she has no personality to speak of. This is probably one of the biggest missed opportunities of this season. I was really interested in a game where we explore Clementine's feelings and thoughts on what she goes through in the zombie apocalypse. Instead, that's all up for us to decide. Clementine is just a blank slate for us to project our personality onto. Now, for original characters, that's fine. It's usually the point of the protagonist in a game like this to be a self-insert. But Clementine at this point is a character with defined personality traits and without writing the choices to revolve around these character traits, it not only leads to out-of-character choices, but also conflicting ones as well. For example, you can agree to be Sarah's friend and be nice to her the whole game, only to leave her to die at the very last second. When the group is arguing about what to do after Kenny fixes the truck, you can tell them that Wellington's out there, and then when Clementine talks to Kenny alone in the truck, she can say that there's nothing out there. What the fuck? This is a clear example of giving the player too much agency with how Clementine can be. Clementine's personality is so up to us to define, I'm surprised we're not able to decide what her last name, favorite food, and social security number are. Lee had more of a defined personality than Clementine does in this game, and he was an original character making him better suited to be a self-insert. And the player agency we have with Clementine isn't even consistent. The game is actually very selective with how Clementine can be at times. During episode 5, for example, you can either defend Arvel from Kenny's treatment of him, or agree with Kenny. But when Kenny first takes Arvel hostage during the gunfight, you can't support Kenny's actions. But why not? I can support Kenny's actions with Arvel every other time, so why not here? I guess I should be happy when the game only gives Clementine options that are in character for her, but it's still part of the inconsistency I'm talking about. And do I even have to bring up again? How you can kill Kenny after he kills Jane, but you can't kill Jane after Kenny dies? I guess not yet since I'm not on that topic again, but while I'm mentioning that, I might as well also mention that making Clementine a blank slate was also a reason why making the ending choice be based around killing Kenny was a bad and stupid idea. 
Because Clementine cares about Kenny, his death scene isn't going to affect everyone the same way. A person who hates Kenny will most likely shoot him as soon as the option comes up, but won't feel the same way about his death as Clementine does. The same goes for the reveal that Jane lied about the baby. Unless Clementine forgives Jane for what she did, she can't agree with what she did. Again, I'm not complaining about the game not giving her out of character options, but it's still part of the inconsistency I'm talking about. I know a lot of people won't like this idea, but I really think Telltale should have been more strict with the choices you can make with Clementine. Maybe have them be locked based on what Lee taught her. Again, I realize it would be frustrating to be locked out of certain choices based off of how you played previously, but it would make your Season 1 choices have more of an impact on Season 2, and it would reinforce the character you've been playing as, as well as prevent Clementine from acting so inconsistently that she can basically have bipolar disorder on top of everything else she goes through. And as I've already mentioned in previous videos, Clementine is too thoroughly plot armored in this game. When Clementine survives falling into ice water and gets shot on the same day, and is perfectly fine after both of those things happen to her, it's when the story goes from being unrealistic to being literally unbelievable. I've actually seen some people state that they don't care about Clementine anymore, and as much as I hate to say this, with how much plot armor Clementine has, I can understand where these people are coming from. You know, Telltale pushed this hashtag my Clementine bullshit towards the release of episode 5, but after all of the out of character actions she can do in this game, all for the sake of being a sock puppet, I don't want my Clementine. I just want Clementine. But you know what they say, hindsight is 2020. If I knew that this is what Telltale was going to do with Clementine's character, I would not have wanted her to be the player character for this season. If you ask me, I think Kenny or Krista would have made for a better protagonist. I know the problem with Kenny being the protagonist is that a lot of people don't like him, so it's not as marketable to have him be playable. But again, after how Clementine turned out, I think it would have been a risk worth taking since it could have ultimately benefited the season. And while the choices you could make with him might have been rigid, the opposite problem of Clementine that she was written in season 2, I honestly think that Kenny could have been given both good and bad choices to make without breaking his character. At least not too much. Krista being the protagonist could have worked out really well for the game if it took place soon after Omid's death, rather than 16 months later. The story of how Clementine and Krista got to the point that they did in Season 2 seems like it would have made for a far better and more interesting story than what we got in Season 2. Krista obviously blames Clementine for Omid's death since she wasn't responsible with her gun, although Krista and Omid were also irresponsible by leaving Clementine alone in the bathroom to begin with, but regardless of such, Clementine is still just a kid. Krista's not just going to leave a kid alone to die, especially after whatever it is that happened to her baby. It seems as though there would be a lot of ambiguous, conflicting emotions in the relationship between Clementine and Krista. Krista might feel a sense of duty and protectiveness, while at the same time being cold and distant towards Clem, with Clementine perhaps being apprehensive and fearful of her. Not to mention the nightmare of the two of them having to deal with Krista's pregnancy, especially the childbirth and eventual loss of her child, all of which happens after her husband got killed, it must have been tragic. The time skip really raises a lot of questions about the relationship between Clementine and Krista, and it's a shame that that's a story that will most likely never be explored in any way. Damn, all this talk about the characters, and I haven't even gotten to the story itself yet. The story is all over the place. It starts out fine, but by the time we get to episode 4, it becomes clear that they're just making it up as they go along. They change things in such a way that it's obvious they were changed between episodes during development. Some of the events that are shown in the previews for episodes 3 and 4 don't happen, plot points get brought up and dropped with no resolution, there's foreshadowing that doesn't amount to anything, and the choice at the end of the game between Kenny and Jane was very obviously supposed to be between Luke and Kenny, as tensions were rising between them towards the end of episode 4, but now they're suddenly cool with each other in episode 5 and Luke gets killed off halfway through. There's unused audio in the game of Luke surviving his fall to the lake, so they obviously changed this while they were still making episode 5. There's also a lot of inconsistencies, such as the Russians that attack in episode 4 having their weapons switched in episode 5. The dialogue isn't as good as it was in season 1, especially when characters respond to Clementine after making a dialogue choice. Most of the time, it's just one or a few words response, if there's even a reply at all. He seemed nice. Damn. Thanks. Yep. You finally opened your eyes about Carver and what a bad person he was. That's something. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely riveting dialogue.
There's even a few instances of poorly written dialogue outside of choice making. A goddamn carrier if I had to. Until this time. Until this time? Really, Jane? This also relates to how characters withhold information from Clementine at the beginning of the game. I know they don't want to reveal too much too quickly for the sake of the player, but this game is so bad at how it keeps certain things a mystery. Who's Carver? It's been five days. Why would Carver still be following us? What's the most important thing in this world? Why did you leave his camp? Because we had to. But why? Fucking elaborate, Doctor. As bad as the dialogue is in this game at times, however, at least the voice acting is as good as one would expect from a Telltale game, so I really don't have any problems here, except with regards to Clementine. Melissa Hutchison reprises her role from Season 1, and while the performance isn't bad per se, it's severely lacking in terms of range. Clementine always sounds like she's bored, sleepy, disinterested, or some combination thereof. Season 1 had Clementine in a number of different situations that allowed her to express a wider range of emotions, but here, she mostly just finds herself in only bad situations, so she can only sound happy when she isn't sounding tired. The only time Clementine has any real emotion in her voice is at the end of the game, either sadness during Kenny's death or when she leaves Kenny, or anger when she finds out what Jane did. I actually think these moments are the best of Clementine's voice acting in this game. I just wish there were more moments like this where Clementine just doesn't sound depressed. She also doesn't sound like an 11 year old at times, not just in terms of her voice, but also with what she says. Kenny, there's air everywhere. Ugh, I hate that line. No 11 year old talks like that. There's even a determinate line of dialogue that acknowledges this. Well, you already sound like a teenager. And this is actually part of another problem I forgot to mention earlier. Clementine isn't treated like a little girl after episode 1, despite the fact that the game constantly calls attention to the fact that she's a little girl. I'm just a little girl! She's just a little girl, Luke. That's crazy, she's a kid! I'm just a kid! Uh, I'm a kid. So you see, it's not like they were oblivious to this, they just didn't care. How else can you explain them writing her like an adult while simultaneously realizing and calling attention to the fact that she's a little girl? One of the things that's supposed to be a selling point for Telltale games is that your choices matter. But playing this game, it's pretty clear that your choices don't matter at all. You constantly get the so-and-so will remember that notification when making certain choices, but the characters clearly don't remember shit. Alvin doesn't care if you blackmailed him or that you later outed him if you did. Rebecca doesn't care if you were antagonistic towards her. Carlos doesn't care if he told you never to speak to his daughter again. Arvo especially doesn't care whether or not you took his medicine. The game is full of this everywhere, and I'd be here all day if I listed every example of this. They even show this notification for things that seem like they wouldn't matter anyway, like why would Jane remember that I said thanks to her after she told me I did a good job, or why would Troy remember that I told him I was looking at comic books. They even have these notifications pop up for characters that are about to die. I can understand doing this to fool players into thinking that these characters will live longer, it worked with Carly in Season 1, but come on, it's very obvious that Pete and Alvin aren't going to make it, so why even pretend that they are? I want to mention again that I do understand that choices in Telltale games are meant to change how the story develops rather than changing the story completely. As Season 1 also had things happen regardless of your choices, but at least in that game, it was clear that there were changes in how things happened even if they happened regardless. Here, your choices might, at most, change how a character reacts to what you said at the moment, or change how the current scene plays out. Immediate changes, but no long-term changes, and anything that seems like it could have a long-term effect either doesn't, or is completely negated later on. And of course, there's a lot of times where the choices you're given all lead to the same thing. Now this is minor, but Season 2 also fails to acknowledge visual differences in characters. In Season 1, the bruise on Lee's face from if he fought Kenny was acknowledged, even if very late in the game, and cutting off Lee's arm had differences in certain moments in Episode 5. The Stranger also mentions that Clementine is wearing his son's sweater if you stole from the car. Here, if Bonnie gets a black eye, it's not mentioned by anyone, and Clementine can get a facial scar from getting hit in the face with a rifle when she tries to help Kenny but it's never acknowledged, not even immediately after it happens. Her facial scar and how she got it is never mentioned by anyone. It's purely and completely cosmetic. And of course, we have the issue of how everyone treats Clementine the same, regardless of your choices. 
Aside from Bonnie, if you choose not to try to save Luke yourself, Sarah and Kenny are the only two very minor exceptions to this. Sarah will treat Clementine a little differently depending on whether or not you choose to be your friend, and you'll get some different dialogue choices in response to that viewpoint based on this as well. However, how you treat Sarah before she becomes determined has no effect on whether or not you can save her, and in fact she dies no matter what, so Clementine's relationship with her ultimately means nothing. Kenny also has a few moments where he treats Clementine differently depending on your choices with him, but because he cares about Clementine and wants to keep her safe, he doesn't stay mad at her if you make him mad, and even apologizes for it later on. Even so, whether or not Kenny lives is dependent on only one choice, so how you treat him before then, like with Sarah, is completely insignificant. I will admit, however, that the choices do feel like they matter most of the time, the first time you play the episodes. If you go into this game blind, then most of the time, it's not until you do another playthrough that you realize that your choices didn't matter. You know, assuming you aren't discussing the game with anyone. Though there are some choices, like the one to rob Arvo, that make it obvious on your first playthrough that your choice didn't matter. And if it wasn't for Season 3 being confirmed just a week after Episode 4 was released, the choice with the family and Jane's ending would feel inconsequential because at this point the game is basically... over. I mentioned in my episode 5 review that Telltale wants the choices in their games to be ambiguous, as in there's no good or bad choice, and I suppose not having your choices matter is technically a way of achieving that, but it's not a good way to do it nor how it should be done. And most of the time what happens as a result of your choices shows that one choice is better than the other. The main problem in this game is that Clementine suffers no negative consequences for making bad decisions. She can try to save herself instead of helping Krista, refuse to be Sarah's friend and treat her like shit for the entire game then not even attempt to save her life, refuse the dying man water, refuse to save Pete's life, she can be rude and disrespectful to Carver, lie to Walter about Nick killing Matthew and let Walter make up his own mind about Nick which can get him killed, she can tell Kenny to shoot Carver or not attempt to save Alvin which leads to his death, she can kill Sarita right in front of Kenny, she can be an asshole to Kenny in the tent, she can refuse to help Luke and then not break the ice after he and Bonnie fall under, essentially letting them die. And of course, she can... <sighs> outright murder Kenny for no fucking reason. All without any negative repercussions to her whatsoever. It's for this reason that I can understand why someone would play the game not giving a shit about anyone or anything that happens because why worry about the consequences of my actions when they are none? And going along with that, there are no dialogue choices that can cause Clementine to die either. There are only a few of them, but Season 1 didn't have moments where Lee could die if he made the wrong choice. Here, there might be a few times where Clementine can die by not doing anything, but she can't make specific choices that lead to her getting killed, not even with Carver. This also further demonstrates how much plot armor Clementine has. Games like these need more dialogue choices that can lead to a game over to make people think more carefully about what they do. Lack of consequences also goes hand in hand with another problem, Clementine has no judge for her actions at the end of the game. The Stranger served this purpose well in Season 1, but Clementine has no such equivalent in Season 2. And speaking of the end of the game, there's also no list of things you did with other characters at the end of the game like in Season 1. It's evident enough that your choices don't matter with how little to nothing changes based on them, but the absence of things I just mentioned simply further enforce the idea that your choices don't matter because there's no consequences to them. I suppose now is as good a time as any to bring up the godforsaken Kenny vs Jane scene again. I already talked at great length and detail about this scene and the multiple endings in my episode 5 review, so if you haven't seen that video and want more clarity on the things I say here, you can probably get it from watching that. Just to quickly recap everything, Jane's plan is stupid because she could have told Kenny at any time that the baby is still alive and it still would have proven her point. It hinges on Kenny and Clementine not finding out that the baby is still alive, which is one of the many ways this plan could have failed, and on top of all that, she doesn't even have a backup plan. What Jane does here makes no sense, and as I mentioned before, the fact that she's willing to die to keep up this lie completely contradicts her survivalist mentality. When Kenny explains why Jane did this if you let him live, it feels more like the developers explaining it to the player rather than Kenny explaining it to Clementine. But her actions here come so out of nowhere, it's out of character for her, to the point where this feels more like a manipulation by Telltale rather than Jane. The option to kill Kenny after he kills Jane should not even be in the game, as there's no option to kill Jane after finding out that she lied about the baby being dead so she can kill Kenny. And besides that, it's hypocritical, contradictory to how events play out in the other endings, and it's disgustingly out of character for Clementine. I cannot express enough just how much I hate this scene. 
If it were up to me, I'd fire whoever it was that thought this choice should even be in the game in the first place. Also, another reason why it shouldn't be in the game is because of something I didn't mention in my last video. The option to shoot Kenny in the end of episode choice list is categorized as survivalism. How the fuck is shooting Kenny survivalism? He's not a threat to Clementine when either option to shoot him comes up. In fact, when the second option to shoot him comes up, he's not even angry anymore. He's sad and distraught over what he thinks Jane did to AJ. There's nothing survivalist about shooting Kenny at all. In fact, the fact that he can get you into a safe haven if you let him live means that shooting Kenny is the opposite of survivalism. Does Telltale not know what survivalism means, or did they not know what to categorize the choice as so they just put whatever there? What's worse is the very next choice contradicts the category of this choice by being labeled friendship. Between a man who cares about Clementine, has known her for months while she was with Lee, and is willing to sacrifice himself so she can be safe, and a crazy woman that Clementine has only known for a few days and manipulates her into killing said man, which one sounds more like a friend to Clementine? I'm just saying. Really, this entire choice and the idea behind it is stupid. They should have just kept it between Kenny and Luke and made it a choice of who to save rather than killing one or allowing the other to die. I'm still trying to figure out why Telltale wanted us to side with Jane or at the very least side against Kenny here. Why give this guy the best endings and then ensure most people wouldn't see them by portraying him as a villain and encouraging people to kill him? Listen, Telltale, if you wanted to kill off Kenny so badly, just kill him off like you would any other character instead of pretending he's determined by doing this. Bringing Kenny back for season 2 only to kill him off again was already a completely stupid idea. I'd prefer if he didn't come back at all in that case, but the fact that they made him determinate and a one-sided choice where most people would be guaranteed to kill him is just added diarrhea on a shit Sunday. Telltale obviously got what they wanted with most people ending up shooting Kenny, but again, why would they want people to fail to get to Wellington if that's what the goal of the game is? I think part of the problem is that despite the game establishing at the beginning that the goal is to get to Wellington, the game's story never really focuses on it. There's nothing in the story thematically or narratively that leads up to Clementine making it to Wellington. So wouldn't it be a good idea to make sure that players don't forget that that's what they're supposed to do? Instead, they establish what the goal of the game is, don't have the story focus on achieving this goal, and then at the very end of the game, actively discourage players from achieving it in a way that makes them feel validated for failing it. What the fuck were they thinking? Even amateur indie developers who never made a game before know that you don't do something like that. As I mentioned before, Telltale wants the choices in their games to be ambiguous, but they designed this choice in the endings in such a way that it's very clear there's good and bad choices here. Things work out for Clementine in the Kenny endings, whereas they don't work out for her at all in every other ending. If they wanted the choices to be ambiguous, they should have had good and bad consequences in all of the endings. And there's no neutral ending either, only good and bad ones. There are practically no downsides to siding with Kenny, and there are practically no upsides to siding with Jane. Clementine doesn't lose anything of value to her in the Kenny endings, and she either finds safety in Wellington or happiness with Kenny. And although the story doesn't focus on finding Wellington, at least you can say Clementine accomplished this even if she turns it away and stays with Kenny. What does Clementine achieve in the other endings? Nothing. She either ends up alone to look after a baby by herself, or stuck with the woman who manipulated her into killing the only friend she had left, and will more than likely abandon her the moment she has to risk her life to save Clem. You could say, in fact, that the other endings are actually a failure for Clementine. If they wanted the endings to be ambiguous or for there to be no right or wrong choice, then they needed to have all the endings be of equal value. Maybe Kenny's sacrifice in his ending could have been him dying to make sure Clementine and AJ make it to Wellington. It would have balanced out the ending so that it wouldn't be 100% positive, and it would have made Kenny's death meaningful and emotional. I suppose you could argue that staying at Wellington is enough of a bittersweet ending to create that balance, but Clementine doesn't technically lose Kenny in that ending. Yeah, she might not ever see him again either way, but at least she knows he's still alive the last time she sees him. Having Kenny die but Clementine makes it to Wellington, and having him live but finding Wellington be an uncertainty, would have added more balance to the ending so one is clearly not better than the other. As for the Alone and Jane endings, I can't think of how they could have been balanced out to be more positive, given how you get them. So they should have been scrapped entirely, limiting the game to two different endings, rather than five. Even without the game deceiving you into getting the bad endings, this ending choice is still shit because it's basically, pick your own ending, regardless of all of your other choices. 
This actually comes back to the point I made earlier about choices not mattering. How can you say that our choices matter when I can get whatever ending I want regardless of whatever else I do? If you're going to have multiple endings in a game like this, then have them be the result of the culmination of your choices. Don't have what ending you get be based off of only one or two choices at the very end of the game. Why was it even necessary to have multiple endings in the first place? Couldn't we just have the game end the same way no matter what like in Season 1? That ending was fine even if Lee died because Clementine and Lee's relationship built up to it. Everything about the game, including the choices, led up to that moment and it's what made the ending so emotional and memorable. Let's imagine if Season 1 had multiple endings and Lee could actually survive the game. This reduces the original ending to becoming a bad ending, something to be avoided or reverted. It completely loses its emotional weight because you know there's a better outcome to be had where everything works out in the end. Even if the other choices weren't objectively better, their existence now means that the moment where Clementine and Lee say their final goodbyes is just one of many outcomes to choose from. Now, let's broaden this idea and imagine that every movie now has alternate, equally valid endings that viewers could choose. The original and tenant endings for these movies now lose their impact simply by existence of the other endings, all for the sake of letting the audience pick the one most agreeable to them. The lack of alternate endings means that the story can't have its authenticity questioned or denied by people who don't want it to be so, and everybody is kept on the same page. Multiple endings sounds like a good idea, but most of the time it's at odds with good storytelling, and good storytelling is part of what made the first game as good as it was. Letting people pick what ending they want for the sake of indulging them undermines the dramatic weight that the story is supposed to have, and it discredits each ending as well. Season 2 would have been better if it ended with Clementine making it to Wellington no matter what, but because Telltale really wanted to pretend that people's choices mattered, they gave us multiple endings instead, and handled them in the worst way possible. And just to further add to my idea that Season 2 shouldn't have had multiple endings, Imagine you don't care about the Kenny vs. Jane bullshit and just want to see all the endings. I know, it sounds like a crazy idea, but bear with me. Suppose you don't actually care about these characters one way or another and just want to see everything the game has to offer. If your first ending was with Jane or ending up alone, then unless you hated Kenny, you're probably going to feel like you fucked up and got screwed out of a good ending when you see the Kenny endings. Maybe that was the intention, but with how much the game wants you to kill Kenny, I can't believe for a second that that's what they were actually going for, besides which, Kenny is a polarizing character so his death is not going to have the same effect on everyone, which is precisely why making what ending you get be based off of whether or not you kill him was a terrible and stupid idea. On the flip side, if a Kenny ending is what you got the first time playing, there's no reason to check out the Gene and Alone endings because they're just so lacking for the reasons I already explained in my episode 5 review. If you've already seen the Kenny endings, you've seen the only endings worth seeing because the Jane endings are anticlimactic, emotionless, and inconclusive, and the alone ending is basically nothing. What I'm getting at here is that having only one ending, assuming it was the Kenny ending, would have been better for the game because it would have ended the game on a high note no matter what. Season 2 would have still been a shit game, but at least it would have been a shit game with a good ending. But instead of giving everyone who played the game a good ending, they decided to have multiple endings and make sure that most people would get the bad ones and possibly be unhappy with it, making for a shit game with a shit ending. And in my opinion, the ending is the worst part of the game you can piss off the player because it's the moment they're going to be walking away from the game with. It's the last thing that's going to be on their mind when they're done playing the game and it can be the sole deciding factor of whether or not what they played was worth it or just a waste of their time. Kenny's ending is the only one that makes it feel like what you went through was worth it in the end, while the other endings just feel like everything you went through was all for nothing. And coming back to the point I was making before, the fact that Kenny's endings are so vastly superior than the others undermines the drama in each of the endings. Again, hindsight is 2020, but if I knew that this is what Telltale was going to do for the end of the game, this is not what I would have wanted. If you ask me, the game should have ended with the Lee Dream sequence. I'll gladly take Season 2 never actually happening over the fucking shit we actually got for the game's ending. It would also mean that Clementine never actually did any of the out of character actions she can do. The last reason I want to give for why Season 2 shouldn't have had multiple endings has to do with Season 3. At the time of this video, Season 3 hasn't come out yet, but judging from all the pre-release material put out so far, it seems like Kenny and Jane will have nothing to do with Season 3 and whatever happened to them is going to be explained away with Clementine ending up in the same place regardless of what ending you got. 
So despite the endings themselves being completely different, their overall effect is going to be minimal at best, so in reality, Season 2's ending choice is just as superficial as every other choice in the game. Why even bother giving us radically different endings if they're not going to affect the story at all in the next game? Well, who knows. Maybe Season 3 will be different depending on your ending. Maybe Telltale will actually make them have a lasting impact on... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But really, and I'm sorry if I said this already, I think at least part of the reason why Kenny and Jane are not going to have anything to do with Season 3 is because, despite all the endless praise Season 2 gets, I think even Telltale realizes they fucked up with the ending choice because Jane proves herself to be completely untrustworthy with what she does in the ending, and after seeing what happens in Kenny's endings, is there really any reason to doubt him ever again? Basically, they can't have Kenny and Jane in any future seasons because decisions regarding both of them would be too easy to make from now on. <sighs> but you know what? In spite of everything I just said, the thing I hate the most about how these multiple endings were handled is how it split the fanbase far worse than anything else I've ever seen before in the gaming fandom. Because of this ending situation and how it was handled, it is now literally impossible to talk about either Kenny or Jane without it turning into a fight about who is right or wrong or anything like that, even if the conversation is about the characters themselves and not the fight or the endings. Hell, even just talking about Season 2 itself in general can lead to an argument about these characters. I used to thoroughly enjoy talking about this game with others before Episode 5 came out, but now, discussion about this game is forever tainted because of the ending situation and how the multiple endings were handled. It's part of the reason why I had reservations about reviewing Episode 5. You can't have a rational discussion with anyone about this topic because if I do something as simple as describe something that Kenny always does regardless of player choice, I'm going to get labeled as a biased Kenny fan by somebody who hates him. How the multiple endings were handled in this game is so bad that I'm now wary of multiple endings in every other game that I've never played before that has them. I can't hear about a game I've never played before having multiple endings without thinking to myself, oh god, how does this game deceive you into getting the bad endings? Though I am happy to say that no game I've played since The Walking Dead Season 2 has done this, so I guess you can say that this game is unique in how completely awful its multiple endings were handled, but it's not a uniqueness that Telltale should be proud of, they should be quite ashamed of it actually. Well this video ended up being longer than I wanted it to. I think I've said everything I wanted to about the endings now, so I'll quickly touch upon other things I haven't mentioned yet. I spent more than half of my last video talking about how badly Telltale fucked up the multiple endings in Season 2, let's talk about something else. Graphically, the game doesn't look that much better than Season 1, but the difference is big enough to be noticeable. Texture resolutions are higher, character models now have a black outline emphasizing the comic book look of the game. And you know what? Despite her many, many problems, at least Season 2 Clementine's visual design is good. She's still as cute as ever and I'm glad that they were able to stay on point with her model. There is one problem though, what the fuck is up with that hole in Kenny's beard? Seriously, how did none of the modelers catch this? Why wasn't it fixed? It's not always easy to see because it's in the back of his beard, but during any close-up shot it's very obvious. Also, the game has fewer graphics options than Season 1 for some reason. Season 1 had lots of graphics options, but aside from full screen and resolution options, all Season 2 gives you is texture quality and anti-aliasing. The graphics might not be bad, but the presentation is. The animation is just as stiff as to be expected from a Telltale game and there's a lot of rather obvious instances of models clipping into each other. I mean, wow. Camera work is boring and generic as most of the time they just focus on whoever's speaking at the moment cut to another character when they start talking, cut back, and so on. There's only a few times where they decide to do something different or get a little fancy with the cinematography. Just a little. The game's music isn't bad, just forgettable for the most part. Part of the problem is that it isn't very audible to begin with. Unless I'm playing with the volume loud or with headphones on, the music is just too quiet to notice. The only song I can really remember is from when Clementine is walking through the blizzard all alone but mostly only because the song is unique to that part of the game. The music is overall just generic and forgettable, but it does at least succeed in conveying whatever mood is appropriate for the moment. But for some reason, Telltale decided to have every episode in this game end with a sentimental song for the end credits. 
In season one, only the final episode ended with a sentimental song and that worked great. Here, they did the exact opposite. The final episode ends with Clementine's theme from season one and every other episode ends with a sentimental song even though it's not even appropriate to do so for most of these episodes. It ends up feeling like unintentional self-parody. I already covered the gameplay when I viewed each episode individually, but just to quickly go over it again, modern Telltale games have three types of gameplay, making dialogue choices during cutscenes, QTEs, and hubs. Episodes 1 and 4 are the only ones that break up between the three enough to make it feel like you're actually playing a game. The rest are all mostly making dialogue choices during cutscenes, so they end up feeling like movies where you just press a button every once in a while. I'd honestly have less of an issue with it if the story was good, but as I explained in my other reviews as well as this one, the story in this game is most certainly not good, and it gets worse as the episodes go on. The QTEs now include having to do directional inputs on the joystick on top of button presses like in The Wolf Among Us, but unlike The Wolf Among Us, Clementine can survive most of these with no input, so you actually have to do most of them. The hubs have been massively watered down since Season 1. In Season 1, the hubs had a lot of things to do on them, and most of them weren't needed to progress through the game, but you could do them anyway, and that was a great thing. It allowed me to play the game at my own pace, I could either spend my time looking at everything and talking to everyone, or just go straight to doing what's needed to make the game go forward. Here, there's almost nothing else to do besides game progression tasks, and it makes me wonder why they even bothered with hubs in some cases. Why bother giving us control over Clementine where you can actually walk around and do things, and then give us nothing to do? Lackluster hubs are also part of the reason why the story's pacing is bad, because there's so little to do in them, I only spend a few minutes, if that, doing something with Clementine, and then it's back to making dialogue choices and cutscenes. It's also part of the reason why episodes are shorter than in Season 1. There's also no puzzles in this game either. I know that in modern Telltale games puzzles are so easy that anyone can solve them, but at least they break up the pace and make the game feel like a game. I only counted one in this game and it's when you have to figure out a way to keep your car horn going to distract walkers in episode 4. I refuse to count turning off the wind turbine in episode 2 because there's no thought required to do it. Lastly, in terms of control it's fine, but Clementine walks so slowly that I don't see why you wouldn't want to always walk fast, even when the hubs are as bare bones as they are in this game. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some behind the scenes aspects of the game. I already covered some behind the scenes stuff in a couple of my previous videos. I already mentioned how Mike was originally supposed to be one of the bandits that attacked Krista in the forest, as confirmed by his voice actor, but there's a lot of other things that were cut from this game, such as Clementine losing her hat and trying to get it back from Sam, the animations for which are still in the game. There was originally a sequence where Clementine and Alvin went fishing at the riverbank before he along with Luke found the bodies at the river with Nick and Pete. There's unused audio of Bonnie telling Clementine what happened to George, a friend of Carver's who Alvin supposedly killed which is one of the many dropped plot points in this game. The escape sequence with the herd in episode 3 was supposed to be longer and more chaotic. Episode 4's title card had its music changed at some point to be less ominous. There's unused audio of a joke that Jane tells Clementine in episode 4. That's a lot of walkers. Hmm. You know that old joke about the two hillbillies and all the sheep? Oh, it's a good one. This father and son are walking through the country and climb a hill, and down below them see this field full of sheep. Now the son gets all excited and says, Dad, let's run down there and fuck one of them sheep. And the father looks at him and shakes his head, is disappointed in him. Son, he says, that's just wrong. The son hangs his head, and the father says, Let's walk down there and fuck all of those sheep. <laughs> you get it? No. I get the feeling that this was removed because they wanted people to like Jean, and having her tell an 11 year old girl a joke like this probably would have been counterintuitive to that. And of course there's unused animations for the Kenny and Jane fight that seem to indicate that the choice originally wasn't going to be shoot Kenny or do nothing. Most of these things seem like they would have made the game better if they were included, but I feel like they were removed partially because they would have caused the episodes to last longer than 90 minutes and partially because they just didn't have time to finish them, which I'll get to in a minute. Then these were brought to my attention. Early versions of the episode's title cards, with most of them having different titles. This, to me, shows that not only did Telltale rewrite Season 2 while it was in development from Episode 2 on, they rewrote it before even Episode 1 was released. You know what, that shouldn't surprise me. Sean Vanaman, the lead writer of Season 1, 
only worked on season 2 very briefly before he left Telltale, and he said in an interview that the story was changed so much that he basically holds no creative responsibility over it. His name actually does appear in the credits for episode 1 however, so I have to wonder just how much of his writing was left in. If I were to guess, I'd say everything before the stupid bathroom scene in the beginning. The dialogue seems sharper and more natural than the rest of the game. I also feel like when Clementine is talking to Luke about herself may have been written by him, seeing as how this is one of the few times where the story actually focuses on Clementine. But yeah, this game not having the same writers as season 1 is definitely part of the reason why it's so bad. Nick Brecken, a former Bethesda moderator who only got the job because he's friends with Sean Vanneman, took over as lead writer for season 2. And with Mike originally being one of the bandits from the forest, I get the feeling that maybe he did have something in mind for where the story was going to go. But whatever it was got scrapped when episodes 3 and 4 were written by different writers. I probably should have mentioned this in my last video, but episode 5 brought back Brecken for the finale along with episode 3's writer Pierre Charette. The fact that Charette wrote the two worst episodes in this game can't be a coincidence. But at the same time, he was the lead writer for The Wolf Among Us and Tales from the Borderlands and those were good games. I don't know. I don't think he's a bad writer, but at the very least, I wouldn't want him working on The Walking Dead ever again. I would love to know what Sean Veneman's original vision for Season 2 was, even if Episode 5's original title was Better to Sleep, which sounds genuinely scary because of what it implies, but I'm sure whatever the original ending was supposed to be would have been far better than what we actually got. And by the way, the PlayStation 3 version of Season 2 actually has Episode 5 listed under its original name in the trophy list. Oh Telltale, you're so competent. But what I really want to show is this, the Glassdoor.com reviews for Telltale. Reading these confirms a lot of my suspicions as to why this game turned out the way it did, and if you can't be bothered to register on the site so you can read the reviews, there's a Tumblr blog post that highlights what I think are the most important parts. The management is not right for the job, you have several people telling you what to do and sometimes it's contradictory, management is incompetent, your good ideas will be stolen and bad ideas will be blamed on the team, your ability to stroke ego will get you further than your job skills, you're trying to build scenes before they're even finished, every aspect of the game is subject to the whims of the executives, my mental health and marriage have suffered as a direct result of this job, decisions that are dictated early in production are reversed later in production. Producers make creative decisions and when it goes wrong they point fingers. Telltale's culture is all about overworking, backstabbing, undermining, and generally seeing employees as expendable cogs. I mean Jesus Christ, this is just depressing to read. No wonder this game turned out the way it did. How can anyone make a good game under these conditions? I mean reading this, it's clear to me now that the executives had more creative control over the game than the people who are actually working on it. I think I see the reason why Vanaman left Telltale. Even if the writers were forced to change the story due to the executives, that doesn't completely excuse the bad writing, but I don't blame the writers for season 2's shortcomings as much as I used to. Episodes 2 and 3 were released about 2.5 months after the previous ones were released, but episodes 4 and 5 were released only about a month after the previous ones were released, which to me says that they were rushed, and if you ask me, it's the most obvious with the multiple endings. The game doesn't really feel like it ends, let alone our Jane endings, and they feel incomplete because of that. The game only ends on a high note in the Kenny endings and they offer the most closure giving them a feeling of completeness. Plus the fact that the Wellington Guard actually looks like an original character as opposed to the family in the Jane ending, which are very obviously mixtures of other characters. I get the feeling that Kenny's endings were already done and possibly originally the only intended endings, but of course they changed this later in development. There's also an old Telltale forum post where a Telltale staff member explains that they want their games to appeal to casuals who don't actually play video games often and therefore don't have time to play for several hours, so they make the episodes 90 minutes long so they can be completed in one sitting. If there was anything that showed that Telltale didn't care about the Walking Dead game or understand what made the first season great, that's it right there. Well, I think this video has gone on long enough. In case it wasn't apparent already, I don't like this game very much. In fact, I pretty much hate it and I've grown increasingly bitter about it over time. I thought I was past that point, but every time I look back on this game, I just get more upset about how it turned out. I really want to like this game, but I can't, and I hate the fact that I don't. I can't recommend this game to anyone, not even to Telltale fans, not even to fans of The Walking Dead. It's a game with no narrative theme or focus created by managers who had no idea what they were doing during development. 
To be honest, fam, one of the reasons why it took me so long to finish this review series is because of how much I don't enjoy this game. And by the time I got to episode 5, I couldn't take it anymore. The only enjoyment I got out of playing season 2 again was recognizing certain scenes and shots as reaction images, and recognizing certain lines of dialogue from inside jokes and other things. Honestly, my reason for giving this game an in-depth critical review is not so much to see if I could recommend it, but to hopefully make Telltale aware of this game's problems so they can learn from their mistakes. Obviously, Season 3 is very close to being released at the time this video is being made, so it's too late for them to take anything I said in these videos into consideration for when making Season 3, but at the very least, should anybody at Telltale watch this or any of my other videos on this game, they can hopefully avoid repeating these mistakes when making other games in the future, as well as future seasons of The Walking Dead. Another reason why I wanted to make these videos is because most of the reviews I've seen for this game are positive and shower the game with praise without considering most, if any, of its many, many problems. Maybe Telltale has gotten better since those glass door reviews were written, but considering how the mainstream gaming media has a love affair with Telltale, and how Telltale themselves don't seem to acknowledge that this season has problems, I have to believe that they don't realize that, so why should they try to improve it if they think it's perfect? And it doesn't help that Telltale no longer communicates with its fanbase as well. To be fair, Season 1 won over 80 Game of the Year awards, and Season 2 didn't win any of the awards it was nominated for. Well, it won two People's Choice Awards and the 2012 BTVA Awards for voice performances, but my point is that that should be an indicator of how much of a drop in quality this season is. I suppose part of the reason why I feel the way I do about this game is because I had high expectations for it. This isn't some low-budget indie game by a no-name developer that everyone expects to suck. It's the sequel to 2012's Game of the Year. You would think they would build upon what made Season 1 great and make it better, but instead they watered down the formula and made everything worse. In any case, despite the future looking bleak for this series, I really do hope that things will get better from this point on, even if I don't expect them to. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this series if you watched the whole thing, and if you'd like to check out some other reviews for this game, I recommend checking out Super Bunny Hop and Flimsy's reviews for this game. They both say a lot of the same things I do, and Flimsy's videos are a bit long, but they are different enough for my videos to be worth checking out, and they even mention some stuff that I don't. I'll be providing links in the description to their reviews, so if you like my reviews, please check them out. And once again, thank you all for watching.